Okay, folks, I think uh, we'll get started. Uh, thanks for your patience, starting a couple minutes late here. Um, I'll first introduce myself. I'm uh, Curtis Mon, uh, the director of this space here, the World Languages and Digital Humanities Studio, which is part of the World Languages, Literatures, and Cultures Department. Uh, actually, my, my home discipline is German studies, uh, but in the course of writing my dissertation, I ended up at the Cologne Game Lab, which is a game design institute in Germany. And so that's how I kind of split between German and game design and ended up with digital humanities, which I think is like the, the perfect spot for the, the blending of those two uh, fields. And I think the studio is, is kind of the perfect spot here for talking about AI and society. Right? It's a conversation that necessarily is interdisciplinary. Reflected in the panel um, we've, we're, we're lucky to have today. I'll introduce the panel in just a minute. Um, uh, before I do, I want to emphasize that uh, this talk tonight is part of a three-part series. Um, and so this is kind of the kickoff. And the next round will be October 26th, um, another Thursday. Um, and that's going to be from 11 to 12.30. And there the topic is going to be AI and Storytelling or storytelling in the age of AI. Okay. It will be moderated, that panel will be moderated uh, by WLLC's Dave Frederick, who's a professor of game design, digital humanities, and classics. Uh, and he will be in conversation with local game developers Joe Payne and Stephanie Essen of the Independent Game Studio Unlimited. They've actually been here at the studio before to talk about uh, gaming and the metaverse. And their project is really fascinating because they're making an augmented reality mobile game um, that responds to your decision-making processes. And kind of, you know, the narrative built along with you and the way that they're building that narrative on a case-by-case -case basis is AI. Also included in that conversation it will be Greg Rogers. Uh, he's actually a University of Arkansas alum, and he's the creative director of the Global Studio called Cosplay. So that'll be a really fun event. That's 11 to 12 30 on uh, Thursday, October 26th. And then the final event of the series is a workshop on AI and teaching. Um, and so our panelists there will be uh, Maggie Fernandez from English. She's currently teaching a course on AI and writing. So it'll be great to have uh, her input. Ken Music uh, from uh, Global Campus. We'll be talking about AI generally in an educational setting. And then um, Guillermo Pupo Pernet, a candidate, PhD candidate in Conflict Cultural Studies, who's uh, also a TA for the Spanish program. He's going to be talking about how you can use ChatGPT uh, actually as, as a tutor. Um, so, a language learning environment. So, need a bigger room. That's a big one. Yeah, we might, we might, we might have to, to switch what I need. I'll be contributing to that one as well. I'm going to be sharing lessons that I've learned this past semester, and hopefully, further lessons or additional lessons that I've learned by that point um, from the course I'm currently teaching, which is called Introduction to Digital Humanities. And we've been engaging with AI since the start of the semester, um, reading widely about the subject, but then also like thinking a lot about prompting and just the fact that it's called prompting, you know, uh, kind of honing the craft of, of asking questions and working with AI and the different ways that we can work with AI, large language models generally. So, um, that will be November 30th, Thursday, November 30th, from 11 to 12.30. So those are our three events. Uh, these are all part of a series of events that we have every semester. And um, I see a lot of new faces here, which I'm really excited about. So I'll just say a couple words about the space here, the studio. Um, one of the things we do is this. This is the DH meetup that happens twice a month. This time, obviously, we're focusing on AI for a three-part series, but we also do pedagogy workshops. We've had guest speakers. This was uh, last, sem uh, last semester when we had uh, Gundolf S. Frying, uh, the co-director of the Cologne Game Lab I mentioned earlier, he was talking about the metaverse, and kind of the history of the future, how we think about the future. Um, we also uh, host the VR classroom for World Cultures. Um, that's run by Zidoro Villa, who's in the back here, and his colleague Michael Hall, and they offer like tailor-made uh, solutions for incorporating VR into the classroom. Some of that um, VR technology was generated here by our very own UA faculty, uh, including Ryan Calabretto from Italian. Um, they have a wonderful Italian VR uh, app, two VR apps that, uh, that uh, are 
integrated meaningfully throughout um, uh, Italian language learning uh, courses. We also look for solutions uh, beyond the uh, University of Arkansas and what we offer here. So um, that's a, one of the things we offer at the studio. We also run student success events, which include uh, peer learning workshops, where students who have found success in the uh, language learning classroom uh, talk about yeah, how they found that success, talk about their experience of studying abroad, et cetera. We also run a series of grants for teaching and research uh, in that context. We also offer curriculum. So I teach, as I said earlier, introduction to game. Uh, sorry, introduction to digital humanities. I also teach uh, digital humanities special topics. In the spring, it was humanities in the metaverse. That was last semester, and the next semester, uh, the subject will be human agency and video games. That's the CT one piece there. Um, so. Uh, that's DH1 and 2. We also have game design 1 and 2, taught by Dave Fruber. And with those courses together, we've created a minor in world languages, game design, and DH. And we have a uh, graduate micro certificate in the works, hoping to have that approved for the spring as well. So, just to give you a quick overview of the studio, the things that we're interested in, research, pedagogy, and of course, programming events like this one. Today, we want these to be as interdisciplinary as possible. So, it's great to see new faces here and have such a wonderful interdisciplinary panel. Use the QR code uh, to uh, go to our page and then follow up uh, us across our social media. Um, okay, we're getting closer now to the panel itself. Um, <laughs> we're almost there. Uh, I guess the hope for today's panel is to at once look you know, more closely at recent developments in AI technology, such as ChatGPT, while also expanding the conversation beyond large language models to think about AI in a much broader context. And so as a way to set up the panel then, I just want to briefly discuss three things that I hope will help us with our conversation and expanding but also deepening. Um, the first is uh, Alan Turing and his theoretical framework known as the Imitation Game, uh, which he published in 1950. I'm hoping that by returning to the Imitation Game, we can unsettle our temporal anchoring to our current moment, right? ChatGPT just happened. It's actually part of this long lineage uh, that maybe doesn't start with Turing, but Turing is a nice point for us to look back to in 2023. I also want us to look briefly at James uh, Bridle's recent work titled Ways of Being, and we're going to be looking at that book as it means to decenter the human focus in conceptualizations of intelligence and how AI can maybe even help us get thinking beyond just. And then finally, of course, we'll be looking at a couple of recent representations of AI in pop culture, including Mission Impossible 7. And I hope that by critiquing these representations, uh, we can think about and perhaps even move beyond uh, the human binary of good and evil, right, when talking about AI. It's either the Star Trek utopian version of AI or then the Black Mirror dystopian version. Maybe by kind of critiquing things like Mission Impossible 7, we can kind of pass that. Maybe, maybe about AI specialized in focus application. So starting with um, Turing, it was in his 1950 paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, where Turing tackles the question of whether computers could be truly intelligent, or could be, so it's a theoretical, philosophical way. The basic premise was that an interviewer, see, um, would interrogate two hidden interlocutors, one human, one machine, and then try to tell which was which. A computer was, if was intelligent, of course, if it could successfully pass itself off as a human in conversation. And so I think, for better and for worse, the framing of intelligence as a machine imitating human behavior has been one of the enduring lessons of Turing's work. But Turing's work was more complicated than just the imitation game. And I think, actually, it was the imitation game was just a means, really, for Turing to make his broader point, which is that a computer could adapt and learn. Right? That was actually the point. And that conceptual paradigm um, is kind of maybe what's been lost uh, in this conversation of focus on the imitation. Beyond this, Turing emphasizes the relational nature of intelligence as it exists between humans and computers. Just as he is excited about the ways in which he found himself constantly surprised by machines, by computers. So there's more to it, I think, when we think about the Turing test uh, than we might first realize. We can add another layer of complexity here when we think that the, the fact of the actual goal of the imitation game was for the interrogator to determine which of the other two was a man and which was a woman. And so gender and the performance of embodied gender and 
the interrogation of gender is actually at the start of our you know, recent kind of trajectory toward AI. Then we get at another layer of complexity when we remember Enturing's own life and his tragic death as a gay man in a deep homophobic era who was forced to choose between chemical castration and imprisonment. And it was making that tough decision then two years later, uh, Turing met his untimely death at just 42 years old. Um, so this is all to say, when we're thinking about Turing and AI, we should never forget the layers of complexity that emerge between the intersection of humans and technology, and all the societal biases that impact all layers of technology and its development, as well as the consumers and creators of that tech. In their 2023 work, Ways of Being, James Bridle, a writer, artist, and technologist, reflects on recent developments in artificial intelligence as it means to kind of grapple with forms of intelligence we can find in the world around us, not just human intelligence, but also intelligence of plants and animals. Indeed, Bridal pushes us to abandon our limited Western ideas about what constitutes intelligence, so that we might look, quote, beyond the horizon of our own selves and our own creations to glimpse another kind or many different kinds of intelligence. In the very world we are destroying, Bridal writes, is a whole realm of other ways of thinking and doing <coughs> intelligence. Ultimately, Bridal challenges us to discover an ecology of technology in which we and our technologies seek out more symbiotic ways to coexist and interact. I'll just end with one more quote here. Bridal writes, rather than being a tool to further exploit the planet and one another, artificial intelligence is an opening to other minds, a chance to fully recognize the truth that has been hidden from us for so long. Everything is intelligent, and therefore, along with many other reasons, is worthy of our care and conscious attention. All right, so Bridal finds this hope in AI that now that we're thinking about intelligence more broadly, that we're more looking to see the intelligence that's been in front of us all along. Finally, I'll close a bit lighter here with uh, a couple or with two summer action films that revolve around AI. Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1, which is Mission Impossible 7, for those keeping track. Um, <laughs> uh, starring Tom Cruise, of course, as well as Ben Rames, Haley Atwell, and some other people. And Heart of Stone, starring Gal Gadot and Jamie Dornan. I should emphasize right now there are going to be some pretty extreme spoilers for both films. I apologize mildly in the case of Mission Impossible, but for Heart of Stone, uh, I'm doing you a favor. <laughs> <laughs> no need. Uh, in Mission Impossible, uh, AI is represented as the entity, an all-knowing, all-powerful force that operates through technology as well as human agents who carry out the entity's designs. Unfortunately for the entity, it is in a battle with Tom Cruise, aka Ethan Hunt, who's obviously <laughs> the most impressive human that humankind has to offer, and so the entity is in trouble. Um, in Heart of Stone, AI is presented as the heart a benevolent piece of technology which is stored in a zeppelin rotating around the Earth at 85,000 feet. Fortunately for the heart, Gal Gadot, aka Agent Stone, uh, is there to make sure that the heart carries out its designed objective, which is to help as many people as possible. And so looking at AI in both films, we see that Mission Impossible completely otherizes AI, right? framing it as the entity, an inscrutable black box, pursuing myriad able beings, uh, evil aim, sorry, including nuclear war, mass genocide of various kinds, and worst of all, attempting to kill Tom Cruise. Um, <laughs> in comparison, the titular heart and heart of stone is presented in the most like human biological metaphor of the term possible, right? The, the heart. Um, so if Tom Cruise and his impossible mission team are working to destroy the entity at all costs, then Agent Stone's team is working to protect and serve the heart. So, I guess reflecting on the hype cycle around AI right now, right, which swings between these extremes of AI is evil or, or, or is a savior sort of technology, um, I'm hoping we can kind of move past this sort of binary and maybe get more focused um, and kind of break this, this binary. I just want to say, like, quick note how Mission Impossible came out only in theaters on July 12th, Heart of Stone only on Netflix on August 11th. So I think AI is also kind of reflecting an interesting 
And the way I is represented in these two things is reflecting kind of some interesting trends in our broader media landscape, right? Where Tom Cruise is clearly positioning himself and the stunts he pulls in front of the camera, that indexical quality of things happening in front of the camera has like the main attraction, something you have to see in the theaters, right? And this is kind of part of that framing is he doesn't do CGI, right? It's Tom Cruise himself performing these acts, even though that's not entirely true. But that's the ethos of these films, right? You have to come to the theater to see what Tom Cruise did in front of the camera. It's not CGI. On the other hand, we have Netflix, which, you know, is absolutely immersed in CGI and AI and all the technology behind its platform itself, right? And so, of course, the streaming giant is going to release a film in which AI is presented as a heart, right? It's <laughs> the thing that's going to help um, get you to continue clicking on Netflix's multi uh, numerous and wonderful offerings such as Hearthstone. So we have those two versions of AI kind of reflecting the broader kind of media culture wars happening more broadly in society. All right, so enough of that. I'm going to introduce our panel now. Um, we'll start all the way on the end with Lu Zhang. Lu Zhang is an assistant professor in the computer science and computer engineering department. His research interests lie in the field of data mining, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, particularly in fairness, uh, in fairness with machine learning, causal modeling, and inference, as well as robust speech detection. Uh, next we have Nadia Issa, um, a professor of graphic design. Her research is focused on examining the contemporary relevance of diverse cultural narratives through the utilization of technology as empowered storytelling tools. She's interested in exploring symbols and archetypes in the context of both individual and collective experiences. And then we have uh, JLA's Jenna Donahue, uh, a philosopher who specializes in moral and political philosophy, especially moral complicity and issues of justice wherever they arise. Her secondary interests include technology, technology ethics, medical ethics, and the feminist epistemology. So um, that's our panel. Can we please give a warm welcome to our panel? Before we jump into questions, I just want to also thank Larissa Roca in the back for all her help. about 20 minutes of just questions up here and then we'll open up to about 30 uh, minutes of questions uh, with the audience. I just want to start asking to our panelists how AI has already impacted their day-to-day -day lives and if that day-to-day -day impact um, is something that you can think through your disciplinary expertise or does your disciplinary expertise help you understand that sort of day-to-day -day impact? Yeah, maybe we'll begin. We can start with you. Okay, so um, so I think the most important impact is the, the, the use of the chat GPT, the AI tools, most of the chat GPT in our daily life and work. Um, so myself, myself, I think my personal experience is uh, 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 I personally use the chat GPT to track many makers, um, including so. Uh, yeah, including so, so many players, uh, uh, but of, of course it's a draft uh, and I will later uh, uh, so refine those layers, but using the ChatGPT can significantly save many, uh, many effort. Uh, and I also want to uh, share something about the impact of ChatGPT on the AI research field. Uh, so, uh, there's an emerging area called the prompt engineering. Uh, uh, Curtis just mentioned that, the prompting. So the idea of the prompt engineering is trying to um, better utilize the chat GPT and also other technical models to solve some traditional problems. Even those problems are research problems. Uh, so the idea here is that uh, many problems uh, can be considered uh, the, the, the data is part of the text data, and the input also can be considered a sequence of symbols or tokens. So any of that kind of problem can be solved by using the language models like ChatGPT. 
where you just input the data and then ask the ChatGPT to give you the output. But the same here that if you, uh, since the ChatGPT are general models, so uh, if you simply ask, if you ask the ChatGPT very simple questions or you, uh, of course in, in, in very simple forms, the answer may not be very accurate. So that is why there's this area or new field called the prompt engineering that studies how to organize, design, organize those questions so that uh, the answer from the ChatGPT can be improved, the performance can be improved. Uh, so, so I think this is a very important trend in this area because that really works. So many traditional problems, they have problems, they have science problems, um, by le leveraging the chat GBT, the performance is much better than the traditional uh, So one of the main, main reason of that is, uh, um, is the original models are quite small, so they are just uh, uh, trained for a specific domain or application. Uh, when you apply that model to some new domain or some other applications, the performance will drop significantly. But the chat GB to a large damage model has become very big, very, very huge, so that you can generalize very well um, if, you, if you use that properly. Um, so that is an important trend, but my, to myself, actually, I don't like it. So this is uh, so this is something like um, so th I think this is against the nature of science. For the, for the science, you you want to understand the reason, not just to develop the solution. Um, but the, if you use the ChatGPT, it's just like if you treat the ChatGPT chat as an oracle, and you just answer a question to it. And then you'll get very good solution. A good answer. But yeah, that's a that's something happening here, but yeah, that's what I want to share. Thank you. Yeah. Now do you want to try that? Yeah, sure. So uh, in the context of my field, I don't want to focus as much uh, on uh, language models, rather uh, my focus in on some image generators. If you could pull out maybe because I, I work with visuals, so I'm teaching this design and technology class this semester, and I realized that one of the most important challenges is to show uh, image generators to students in a way that they don't feel overwhelmed and in a way that they would like find advantages of using such models and incorporate them in their projects. So, this, is, this image was AI generated and the prompt was artificial intelligence and society. Uh, let's move to the second one maybe. If we could pull it, pull it up from YouTube. Uh, it's very short, just one minute. Oops. Or not. Maybe it's not late.
So the images that, that you, you see are uh, done by people from inside out organization. And then my students use an AI to generate the model to add face expressions. So they went through 93 faces and they use a very simple AI model that you can maybe elaborate more on that combines the data of like scans the human face uh, looking at the muscles and the 93 faces were AI generated and then uh, moved to uh, augmented reality so every single face was scannable. And this project kind of like raise questions, uh, what is the role of artificial intelligence while interpreting our emotions, and how those emotions are generated in a way that are not real emotions, and uh, how we can like respond to them. It also like led to uh, questioning the way how we interact with, with, with this technology. Yeah, uh, let's move maybe to that second one. Because then um, we started like questioning that, um, okay, so let's go. So this is the, uh, this is an image that was done by student based on multiple layers in Adobe Photoshop and it was interpretation of mythology and symbols and archetypes that uh, can be found in mythology and like, the prompt was to try to generate an image using AI generated AI models that is as close as possible uh, to the original one uh, and we talked about such things as uh, or ask uh, questions if AI for example it gives us access to collective memory how, how which role does it play with like interpreting symbols uh, the students, of course, were confused. We can like move to the second image and third image because the prompt was the same for each one of them. So, for example, they're like, oh, this AI is speculative because the windows are rounded. Uh, so I have to like explain to them that it's like a weighted average or some of some visual data. Uh, and uh, yeah, and they added the prompts there as well. Um, and also, uh, for example, examine uh, what would happen if we type in Ariba symbols, or Nigeria, or indigenous futurists, and, like does AI understand that? Uh, kind of like realizing that the input, like this kind of input gives some sort of like output, so the way those models were programmed is this kind of results they would get. Also, we talked about bias and average representations that AI, AI offers. Uh, yeah. Or for example, can you tell who is Shango, the god of lightning and thunder? So for example, if we add Zeus there, or if we would prompt it as Zeus, it would like pull out a representation of Zeus. Just because it's a Nigerian god of uh, lightning, it doesn't have access to, to that sort of representations or to that sort of data. So, I think it was an interesting project. So they kind of like get their hands on and, and realize in which ways they can use AI uh, as a way that uh, helps them to see what is the general uh, understanding of an image or of a symbol. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And maybe we can talk to, to Jenna. How AI is impacting your everyday life, and then like how your disciplinary expertise like helps you actually recognize that. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I think of myself as a philosopher and a teacher and a person. So if we think about how it affects my teaching, I mean, I think ChatGPT just like changes the ball game with respect to your standard like assign a philosophy paper. <laughs> like it's just totally different than it was even just five years ago. Um, and so I try to think of it, and this is from my embedded ethics background, working at Harvard with computer scientists, I'm trying to like think about, like you said, not understanding AI as like a binary where it's good or bad, but like as, as a thing that we're faced with and how are we gonna cope with it as people. So trying to think of like adjusting assignments, adjusting the way I teach uh, in face of ChatGPT as like an opportunity to do those things better. Um, I don't know that I'm getting it right, but that's what I'm trying to do is like, 
So with my students this year, I mean, I'm very privileged in my department. I get to teach a section of 24 intro honor students. And so I met with each one of them individually to discuss their paper drafts, which I never you know, could have made the time for if it was a 400 student class, but I also probably wouldn't have made the time for before ChatGPT. And so taking the time to talk through the ideas with them in a way that I like maybe had no space for before. And then um, you mentioned Ken, he, uh, gave some money to some of us, which is great, to do this SEC artificial intelligence teaching course. Um, and I'm cautiously optimistic that they're going to have some suggestions for how to scale these kinds of strategies. So the problem with the strategy I just said is that it takes a lot of time on the side of the instructor. And so as we're thinking together as teachers about how to combat ChatGPT, I think we're going to want to be thinking about strategies that can scale to the larger classroom. Um, with respect to disciplinary expertise, I mean, I guess I, as a moral and political philosopher, as a social philosopher, I'm just really worried about AI, not because of what it is, but because of who's in control of it. So, like, it, it really accelerates the concentration of power in the hands of, like, a few big tech companies. And AI itself and large language models makes this worse because, you know, there's only a handful of companies that control the amount of data that you need to run through the large, large language models. Um, and so I just get really <laughs> politically worried that we are not controlling this in the right sort of way um, in terms of like representation of the people deciding who gets to have this power. Um, and so that's not even necessarily particular to AI, but I see it as like a particular threat of the AI technology given the way we've allowed it to develop now. Um, and then for folks that are interested in thinking about this more, uh, Seth Lazar's Tanner Lectures, he's a political philosopher that has gone really into ethics of AI. Um, and he gave the Tanner Lectures last year at Stanford. It was like a big deal that they were even on ethics of AI and not more like classical philosophy. But he talks too about something called internal governance. And that AI raises a real problem if you're a philosopher that thinks about internal governance. Because even if we put in regulation that we think is going to work, even if we solve the problem of where the experts exist and solve the external regulatory problems, you're going to have the problems that the internal decisions are still being made by non-public representatives. And so these are the kinds of things that I think about when I bring my disciplinary expertise to bear on the questions of AI. Nice. Thank you so much. Um... We've heard the terms, you know, chat GPT, large language models, and AI, and we've kind of, you know, they've been blending throughout this conversation. I'm wondering, though, maybe we can start with you, like, how can we think about chat GPT in relation to, say, like, broader philosophical notions of AI, right? Like, is, and I guess maybe the follow-up is like, is, is chat GPT really a before and after sort of moment? I mean, I feel like it is. I, yeah. Not everyone agrees with me on this, and I think that there's reasonable disagreement here, but I have not ever seen philosophers stand up and care about AI in the way that they are now. And so it might not even be that the technology itself is like the before and after moment as much it is, as it is the response. People are noticing that like their student, and <laughs> some of my colleagues, not here at U of A, just to be clear, um, are like, oh, I can tell if a student, you know, generated a paper using, um, you know, the models that existed before, and then you give them, I mean, somebody on um, Automated did like a study where they sent teachers AI responses to their prompts, and they couldn't, they couldn't tell them apart. So I, I feel like in terms of education, it's before and after moment, just because people, I think, before weren't recognizing the impact of the technology on our classroom, and now sort of are starting to realize that it that something has to change. Do you do you ever think about ChatGPT and these large language models in, in the context of like the Siri Alexa moment? You know, and how that I don't think I don't remember there being massive discussions around AI at that time. But that's kind of weren't we facing a similar point? Yeah, I'm probably the wrong person to talk to you about Siri. So I, these always listening devices really freak me out because they're an invasion of privacy into other people's space. Like people walk into my house and they have their phone turned on to, to, to such that it's listening to what I'm saying. 
I actually think it's like a huge violation of my privacy when they enter my house. So this was, this is maybe only interesting to me, but I thought about this a lot during the pandemic because we were all of a sudden Zooming with each other and you were Zooming with someone that had an always listening device on, they were listening to stuff happening in your house without your consent. And I, so these are the kinds of things I think about as a moral philosopher is like, we are sort of letting the technology take off without necessarily, and this is why I love the digital humanities because we as humanists can ask these questions about like, should we be letting the technology take off without thinking about how it's impacting people's lives? Um, and then there are of course the scary stories that I'm sure people know about like, you know, emails with private conversations getting sent to people and that because of Siri and Alexa and these devices. So we kind of move to concerns <laughs> about- I know, I'm device. sorry. No, I don't, good. I, I good. don't mean in the binary no. sense, I just mean no. in the like failing to question sense. Absolutely, I, I, maybe we could turn to, to Lou now and, and yeah. some of your research and what you're, what you're concerned about and, and how you're approaching that as a researcher Training models are actually model. Uh, um, so yeah, so this is a there's a of course there's a there's an increasing concern about the bias of model, but uh, actually the the, uh, the emerging of the chat GPT really surprises a lot of the researchers, including myself. Uh, so so before that, we are actually not concerned about the bias of the Large language, model, large language model like ChatGPT, we are actually uh, more focusing on more um, simple models, decision models, decision making models. Uh, so think about the, the models that uh, really like the, the data to make the mission decision, or the bank can use the model to make the local decision. Right, those are some, uh, those will not be very too complex, not be, uh, complex models. But those can be, uh, right, the uh, models can be used in the automatic decision process. Uh, and we were uh, more focusing on those type of uh, models and the bias in terms of those, mo mo those models. And from that perspective, the, uh, I think the, the, situ the situation is on the control because the <laughs> data is not too large, the model is not too complex, uh, we can for uh, example, we can have many different ways to to address this, to mitigate this problem. For example, we can uh, clean the data before it goes for training. Uh, we can add constraint into the model um, so that when you're in the training, it uh, uh, forces to comply with some constraint so that it's not too biased. Uh, so those are those things are under control, but. Uh, but the chat GPT, you know, this, uh, those models, the, the data is huge. So today we still don't know how large the data is that you use to train the chat GPT. We don't know, it's not, it's not open source. And the open eye does not, uh, even, uh, does not uh, disclose that uh, information. And we also, we don't know how the model is trained. We, we, uh, and so, so there are some uh, uh, talks by the chat GPT uh, briefly introducing the training techniques, but those are very general, uh, not, not detailed techniques. So we still don't know how it is trained. Um, and we don't know how the model looks like. We know it may be based on the transformer because it still has a T in its name, where T stands for the transformer. Uh -huh. But we don't know the exact uh, architecture of ChatGPT. So, so if we, uh, as a researcher, if we are, <laughs> We are, we are asking to talk about the bias in ChatGPT. We really don't <coughs> don't know how to do that. We can only uh, maybe what, something that we can do is to design some experiments to test the bias or potential issues contain the ChatGPT. Uh, but uh, but we don't we really don't know how to solve that problem. Thank you. Nadia, can you talk about some of the concerns you run into? Maybe concerns that have been expressed yes. in, in your field. So I think there's no way back because this is happening and AI models are going to dominate our life. Uh, I think it might cause some sort of like existential crisis because somehow we're questioning the uniqueness of human brain 
I mean, the whole structure is based on neural network and so on. So like copying that the brain and also like the uniqueness. Um, but I think uh, this concern maybe comes with every technology. Like at the time where photography was invented, it was also like a shock. The painters like, it's gonna happen. Are we gonna stop painting? And, and so on. And then we kind of like adapted to the technology. Uh, also there's uh, this question of uniqueness regarding the work of art. So for example, I might refer here to the famous uh, essay by Walter Benjamin from 1936, the work of art in the era of mechanical reproduction and how mechanical reproduction takes away the aura or the presence of a work of art in time and space. Also, I think another question, I mean, this thing can generate images or it can generate text, but I think when we think about artists, writers, designers, we kind of think about the whole package. We think about their stories, who they are as people, like what are their experiences. So I don't think computers can replace that. I mean, there was a movie, Her, I think 2013, where I don't remember who was the actor, but he fell in love Walk with the Phoenix. voice of Scarlett Johansson and Scarlett Johansson was kind of Johansson, was kind of like a prototype for, for AI. Uh, but still, I believe that there's this like significance in like human to human experience, uh, which we noticed after COVID, for example, right? Like people were really, uh, they really wanted human to human experiences. Uh, so hopefully, those models will like help us to understand language or art more, but not necessarily shift the dynamics that will no longer have human production. Because that would be probably the end of sort of civilization and history. At least that civilization and history that's like written by humans. So yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> I think with that uh, we should open up the conversation to the audience. Uh, and field uh, questions. And also, I'm devastated that you, someone cited Benjamin before me. The German studies up here. Sorry. Wait, wait. No, it's also exciting. Uh, we, we, should, we should, yeah, open up to Q&A. We have uh, about 30 or 20 minutes or so for a question from the audience, and then we're going to have uh, food uh, served after that. So let's open up. Uh, questions to the audience now. Questions for, for our uh, panelists. I know there are questions. <laughs> yeah, in the back. Jenna, can you say how your discussions with your students mitigate concerns that they'll end up using AI to write the papers? I don't quite see the connection there. Well, it depends on how you use the discussion. But the, in theory, if they have to turn in a draft, and then talk to me about the draft. At the very least, they will have to read the draft. I mean, it's, you're totally right that it still could have been generated by ChatGPT, but they have to come prepared to the meeting, ready, ready to discuss the topic. So it's sort of like an oral exam without the pressure, because I'm not actually grading the conversation, but they have to do some work with the paper that they don't have to do if they never have to actually talk to you about the paper. So you already had the discussions about the papers that they have written? Or was this so they turned in a round of drafts, okay. one, one round of drafts, and I talked to them about their, so I, I graded the drafts. It's not the grade that they get on the draft is not gonna count for their final grade in the class, but I give them a grade because students are really motivated by grades and they want to know how they did and they don't want to just see my comments. Right. So I grade, I give them a rubric, I grade the rubric, I give them a letter grade, and I give them comments and then we come in and we talk about the paper. I only did 15 minutes per student because it, it's a long time to meet, which is still eight hours, right? Um, sorry, not eight hours, I can divide, six hours. Um, but you're, if you're looking for ways to mitigate the possibility that they don't do any critical thinking, having to talk to you about it, even if they generated a paragraph or two using ChatGPT, they still have to be prepared to have a conversation about how they take the argument to go, what objection they raised and why. Um, I don't think 
any method is going to be perfect. Um, but that's the idea. And so then they'll revise based on my comments on the conversation before they turn in their final paper. Do you have any sense just in what you read? Do you, I mean, not that, I don't have much confidence, but certainly my own. Yeah. So if, if, if the prompts are good to, to distinguish human from chat GDP, but do you have any sense of whether they were using it? So, of course, I want to say they weren't, but they're quite good at what Lou is calling prompt engineering. Yeah. Better than we think they are. Yeah. Um, and so, there's a good chance they were using it at least to write the thesis or to generate the example that I asked for. They could take my prompt and have put it in to generate their examples. But they were able to talk to me about like why they took the example they did and how they thought it connected to the Republic. And so for me, that counts as a win, even if they're using the program to help them, because they're still being forced to do some critical thinking and not just rely on it wholesale. Good, thank you. I have a question here. So from the technology perspective, I don't think there's a, there can be a way like, efficient, like can efficiently distinguish the human read, uh, written article and the generated article. Uh, because any way, any method of uh, doing this can be further used to improve the model. Mm -hmm. So, so no one marries it because it's a, it's a human involved method or it's an automated method. All of the methods can be used to further improve. So, uh, so I, uh, myself, I, I don't think uh, that there, there will, there's going to be a method that can be distinguished uh, unless there's a policy uh, that requires that any AI generated content should contain some sort of work that can be used to distinguish. Uh, but currently, there's no such thing. So this is just my, uh, uh, yeah, this is my uh, uh, my uh, Thank you. But Lou, if you did that, couldn't they still just type the sentences in? They couldn't control C, control B. But couldn't uh, they just no, no, type yeah, the sentences? I'm talking, I'm talking uh, okay, so this is uh, this is this is not uh, this is uh, this is just my some uh, very high level thinking about this. Yeah. Uh, because the uh, language models, so how do it work? This it, it, uh, it, it works to approximate the distribution of the words. That is the word from the human authors. So since it's a very so it's a similar distribution, uh, so I'm thinking that maybe uh, I don't know maybe there's a way to inject something into that distribution so that uh, so that from the uh, from 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 each word or sentence you cannot distinguish. But if you look at the article and then use the some some errors to compute the distribution, and then there will be some some minor. Nuts. Yeah. Nuts. Um, yeah. yeah. So this is uh, this is my idea, uh, but uh, but, uh, uh, but I I am not aware of any research. Sounds like you need to write a paper. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a yeah. yeah. I'll just chime in there by saying a, a, a text that I've uh, just used in my uh, intro to DH course. It's called Assigning AI: uh, Seven Approaches uh, for uh, Students with Prompts um, by Ma. I thought it went really well. Uh, you know, because it's a DH course, it's all meta reflection on using these tools or not using them or interacting with them, forming some sort of human computer symbiosis. Um, but I think there are also the practical lessons in there for, for, for instructors who are maybe are not engaging that kind of um, meta analysis. Um, so I'll, I'll share the title. Okay, let's take another question from the audience. Yeah, close away. Yeah, this is probably a question more for Nadia. It's about, uh, now that you were talking about the aura and both things, uh, let's say, uh, in, the, like, in, the, in the contemporary world of graphic artists, and how, the, how as, as, a, as a graphic artist, can you incorporate your own like signature or your own style, your, Working with a prompt with AI, basically your chat or uh, no, you're using Adobe, right, for mm -hmm. class. So how can you incorporate your own style? And since also uh, Lou was saying that 
Um, we don't know how it's trained actually. We can assume that it's being trained like just taking things from the, I don't know, from the web and uh, creating these images or these pieces of art from things that already exist. How can you add your own style to it? And if that, and if that's possible, how can you avoid uh, like plagiarism issues or uh, copyright issues? And also, as a graphic artist, like people that work with uh, or in the graphic field, graphic artist field, uh, or graphic design, you usually have like a portfolio. Yes. Can you put that in your portfolio, saying that it's your work, yes. or do you need to say like have a disclaimer like this was done with AI, and how does how does that look in in your portfolio, like in a professional setting? Those are very interesting questions and, and, and concerns. So looking at the uniqueness, my speculation is, and it's already happening, but not on a massive scale, because you have to like own a computer with, with large capacity of like dealing with data that artists or designers can really train their own models. And because the output, like that output equals input equals bad output. But the output could be like precisely controlled by the artist. And such a time was made, for example, uh, by Microsoft when they created the new Rembrandt in 2016. Or there was another portrait that was like generated on a very precise selection of data and sold for over half a million dollars at Sotheby's and so on. But the problem is now that we don't have access, like a regular art student or professor, we don't have access to such computers. Uh, another thing answering that is that I think that maybe like design and art is more about generating concepts, so the visuals play a significant role, but also the concepts have to like come from, from, from an artist or from a designer. Uh, similar to, for example, what happened when Marcel Duchamp brought the famous Pusquart to a gallery. It's about like what artists declare as art can be art. Uh, there are no regulations that copyright anyhow the AI model. So honestly, I don't know if a student wants to like have an image that is generated in their portfolio, they can, they can do that, and there's like no way I'm gonna find out. Uh, it's more about like maybe creating the assignments that they have to like explain the concepts and bring visualizations, and the visualization can be created by AI. The final work is there. It's very complicated. I mean, there's a lot of concerns. Uh, uh, until it, the, the images will become somehow regulated or students will be like required to say that this is mid-journey or Adobe Firefly generated. I mean, there's a way to find out, but it's similar to ChatGPT that everybody has like a unique language of expression, so I can tell that the student didn't do it because it doesn't match with the sketches or the whole visual concept that they presented. But I'm still saying art is not about just creating images or design. It's like a whole research that is done before, very similar to any other field like mathematics, uh, that the image is just like one of the elements of the whole concept. Yeah, but very valid concerns, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, I just wanted to add that it really makes sense for me because now that you were also bringing the issue with the camera at that time, where like camera will replace the painters, right? But it was just the, it was just like the, uh, like the machine or this yes. thing that people have had available for them. So, I feel like humans, uh, they basically took ownership over the camera, and it's just a tool for, like, expressing like this kind of artistic, uh, like, concept, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm thinking the same will happen to uh, AI, like humans owner, like taking ownership of the of the technology and they will be just like another tool to represent things. I mean, somebody owns the data, but we yeah. don't know who that person exactly <laughs> is. So there's she like my human no problem. There, but that, that's the problem, we don't know who owns the data, because that's the human aspect. Could, could you maybe chime in, we have another question, could you chime in now from the governance angle here about how do you 
possible solutions or maybe problems involved? Possible. I mean, so I just think it's a huge problem that we don't know who owns the data, like Nadia said. I mean, I do think there's like a, this is like orthogonally connected, but I saw a grain of hope in the recent resolution of the union um, writers, actors strike in Hollywood because part of what they won was that the studios can't just like take the, the image generated by an extra and then use it to populate their films using CGI. Like, so in a sense, they won something that seems to me important for all of us. Like, I don't want them to be able to just use my image that they got on the street and use it in their movies without compensating me. Um, it seems to me that who should own the data is the creator. And then there's a, there's a difficult question for artists and philosophers to think about together about who counts as the creator. But part of what I see as the difficulty with AI generated art is that we're not, we're now not compensating artists. Um, I think Nadia brings a good point about like, it's not clear that that's a whole new problem that like never happened before when we think about the mechanism and the camera and stuff. But I still, I get concerned that the camera is just me clicking a button. It's not me combing the web for artist generated images and then I'm not compensating the artist themselves. So it seems like a seems like a problem that I don't have a solution to. <laughs> and maybe we'll um, we'll get closer to this as the conversation goes on. But I saw that Ryan My question is very different. So I was on a plane today, the universe organs are hosting the event for the SEC. And I happened to sit next to the Dean of Graduate Studies of UGA. And we spent time in the whole flight. But part of our conversation was no break on that flight. I didn't, sleep. <laughs> uh, I didn't try to like doze off and just kept talking. Yeah. But anyway, um, it was a great conversation. But in the end, our last conversation was on AI at the graduate level because I imagine, like at UGA, we don't have rules about this in our master theses and doctoral programs. So what do we think? Is it, are we, you know, if it's not written down as academic dishonesty, A, how do we respond to that? B, what is the future of these things and the role of research at that level? We talked a little bit about the undergraduate level and writing papers and brainstorming. And, but what are the bigger picture? How are we going to respond? How would you like to see the university respond? Yeah, I mean, so I think. I think of academic dishonesty as anything that I say in my syllabus they can't do. So I feel like as an instructor of a graduate seminar, I do have the ability to write down, like you shouldn't be using AI to write yeah, yeah. papers for you. In your syllabus, but like in the rules of the graduate school, Yeah. for your MA thesis or for your PhD thesis, is that written in? I'm in not, UGA, it's not. I, I would be surprised if it was. It's, maybe this is not a welcome thing in this room, but like I, wouldn't be that mad if a student used ChatGPT to like help generate a bibliography and then used that as a place to start their research. Because that just strikes me as like another tool that's now available to them in the way that like, you know, I don't have to go to the library for all of my articles. I can go online and get them from JSTOR. Um, I wouldn't personally, and I think this is something we have to think about together as teachers, like I personally wouldn't want paragraphs in the thesis to have been generated by the AI. But that's just because I think like developing your own writer's voice as a philosopher is like an important skill that we're teaching in an MA program. But I don't know that like I'm the only person that should be present in these conversations. It seems like the graduate school needs to talk together about what it is that we think of as our goals for our students. Like what do we and, and what do we want? And in an ideal world, with the graduate student student council too. Like they should have, what, what do they want us to be helping them to be able to do? So that's just my Yeah, so I kind of got a hashtag comment on this. Mm -hmm. so actually, we are, right now, we are using ChatGPT to uh, in the writing of the papers, research papers. Um, uh, mostly we use the ChatGPT. Research papers are not, research not research. MA theses. Um, not theses, but uh, in our field, uh, yeah, uh, uh, the major part of the dissertation is this conference paper. Yeah, so we, we don't ask the students to write a whole new thesis uh, because the, the students have already uh, been doing research back in the past years and published and 
those works can be included uh, in the presentation on CSS 4.0. Um, so yeah, so 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 we can we, we are writing uh, we are using it uh, we are using the JVP GPT to refine the language, um, and I can share the, the the policy of the AI conference. Um, so the, so uh, the policy is that um, the paper cannot be generated by the uh, uh, language model as a whole, but uh, you are allowed to use the, the language models to refine the paper. Sure. Yeah. Like the way you might use Grammarly? Uh, yeah. So it can like edit the paper, but it can't yeah, fully yeah. generate the paper. Uh, yes, the Grammarly can detect the Grammarly levels, right? Um, yeah, yeah, similar, but the, um, a, a more powerful tool. Mm -hmm. Setting up guidelines. So it's okay for brainstorming, it's okay for outlining, it's not okay for actual content. And also, it's coming out more and more in the era of journal. We're just having this conversation with these like, Some journals say it's not out. You cannot utilize chat GPT or you have to cite chat GPT accordingly. <laughs> Which I have not seen that in the time. I'm not seeing it now. But he was a plant pathologist. Yeah, another question in the back. Yeah, um, you know, one, one tool that's been used, I don't know the terminology, but uh, the ability to analyze text to pick up quirks of different writers. You know, the Unabomber was identified because uh, his manifesto had spelling quirks and word choice quirks that were unique to him. And uh, of course the problem with our students is we don't have a corpus of their writing to compare, uh, but you know, if you say, well, if you have to do a text, you know, a handwritten answer in a, in a green book, not a blue book, but not a green book, uh, somehow you could compare their writing to that and say, well, this is not you. Um, and, you know, I hate to be that kind of like FBI approach to, uh, to my, my students' writing, but uh, it becomes a real issue. Uh, I wonder if that kind of thing could be a countermeasure. Um, I, I, I don't know. Uh, um, I don't know if we can really do that. Each student would have a writing profile, this kind of thing. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. But the, the, the writing style can change. You can, you can just, it can't change. Yeah. Right. Especially for people who are just in the process of maturing, you know, you try on different styles. And, uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, I think there's still like certain word patterns that persist. I mean, I think it's an idea. My concern with ideas like that is that it takes a structural problem and tries to propose an individual solution. So what I think we need, though I don't have one, like I was saying to Curtis, I think we need a structural solution. So like, I guess I maybe am reading into what Ryan said, but I sort of think this needs to be solved more at an institutional level, not at the level of like asking individual instructors to try to decide right. What, how they're going to approach it and what they're going to do. I'm not opposed to assignments like this, sorry, like what, what Curtis was saying about like instructors coming up with creative ways of incorporating it, but when it comes to like a solution like that, I just think, I mean, I'm not a handwriting expert. I'm not one of the experts that the FBI is calling to try to figure out the writing works of the Unabomber. That's not my area of expertise, and I don't want it to become my area of expertise. Like I have other things to offer the world. Um, and so I, I just think like we need to think about I like the creativity, but I don't like the individualistic structure. I think we've got time for like one or two more. Richard, you have a question? Yeah, I don't know if it's a question. It's just kind of it raises a whole bunch of issues, this, this discussion. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the first one that comes to mind is did we miss it when we uh, invented the printing press? <laughs> and and, and uh, the, the printed word became the standard of communication where to me if I'm expressing a complex idea I want to sit down face to face with whoever I'm talking to um, so that the nonverbal cues are to me are as important as the words um, but then uh, the whole idea of um, having a research paper and what you're doing is you have a bibliography and you have all these other writers you're combining the ideas from all these people and putting it together in your own paper. Um, is that 
really what education is about, Re repeating what somebody else has said, or do we really want to have a way to come up with new ideas that somebody else hasn't written about that is, is part of our own creative uh, view on the world? Um, and, and I kind of have issues with some of that otherwise in, in the university here. Um, and just, I, I, I understand it's important to, for people to have their own voice and be able to express themselves. Um, and whether the, the idea that getting a grade and getting a degree is, seems to be the goal of most students, instead of how do I learn to express myself, at which point all these other AI tools may not be relevant at all. And, and so have we emphasized the wrong issue here um, in the whole grading degree program? Yeah, and, and there's, I can go on for another half an hour, but those are enough to give you some idea of the, the issues that this brings up in my mind. I don't know if anybody has comments. <laughs> Oh, yeah, well, one is, I mean, the, the use of different sources, it's, you can make a totally new combination of things you got from somewhere else. Uh, I mean, I do this all the time, because Spinoza drew from all kinds of things, and the people that he drew from were mainly all kind of mediocre writers who did kind of routine things, and he made this like, amazingly new combination of them. So I don't see that as necessarily just uncreative. I mean, I think I would share your concern about motivating students by grades and degrees. Um, I don't think the best classes are, you know, oriented around the grades and the degrees, but I think we also have to be realistic that, like, for some of our students, that's what they're here for, because they need it as a ticket to what something else that they want to do. And so I think, like, we have to keep both and. Like, make the class so enjoyable that they get something out of it on accident. I think, we, you know, we're going to, because of the massive scope that you handed to us, but if we were to pull back, say, to the Enlightenment Project of the Encyclopedia, and the way that that kind of organizes our approach to just understanding the world, um, and seeing where we've gone now with AI, what we're kind of hoping for, some people are hoping from it as this anticipation tool, this tool that's going to kind of tell you what you need to know, even maybe before you formulated the prompt. Like, that is kind of, in a way, going against that, that, that project, which has its own problems, I want to be clear, the Enlightenment project, of, of you know, putting the information up front of you and having you kind of select it and pull from it. Now it's saying, like, I'm going to tell you exactly what it is that you need to know. And if, if it is a black box, we don't know how it works, then I think that's actually deep in trouble. That if students start using this as a crutch and don't understand what's going into it, um, then we made a huge mistake. Um, so I, I guess that's our approach to scope here. And, and just evaluating what's correct. I mean, you can find a million things on the internet, and not all of it's correct, and, and how do you evaluate that? And to me, that's more important than uh, can you regurgitate it in a way that, that makes sense on some research paper. Um, but, you know, that, on the other hand, I think that like, there are always like, side things I think ChatGPT has general problem with like footnotes. It doesn't do a huge problem. A huge problem. So, I mean, yeah. they will be like they have to still provide a source for what is that thought. And if it doesn't sound like them, it's like they have to like uh, kind of elaborate on, on that. But I agree. Like the the progress comes from like thinking outside the system. And AI is some sort of system. Not a mathematician, but there was something about the square minus foot of a layer, and the current models didn't contain it because everything was like on plus. So the one mathematician came with this idea of like square minus foot of, of a layer, and that was like the mistake, the thinking outside those systems. So I think the innovation is still possible, and everybody's like citing everybody, but it's about like finding the mistake. The thing that is like outside the system, like I said. And I want to make it uh, make me concentrate here. Um, so, 
so for for uh, for the science and technology uh, and the engineering field, um, so our research is to develop new uh, method for theory of algorithms. So those are the research. Writing papers are uh, just a, is a, just a way to uh, deliver this content to to the to the uh, to the, uh, to the audience. So so writing paper itself is not the research. Uh, it's not it's not doing research. Uh, before writing a paper, the research is already done. Okay, the, the writing the paper is to wrap up together all the results you have uh, and then to deliver that. Uh, so from that part, I think the, uh, uh, the, the use of ChatGPT is, is fine, but I do share the concern that uh, for uh, some other uh, fields, or even for the general, uh, for the general field, uh, the use of the, the ChatGPT can um, can replace the human because you can even use the ChatGPT to generate the prompts. Right. right. So, 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 so right now maybe we do, we, we can think about this creative work is to uh, develop the prompts, but actually you can ask the ChatGPT what the what the appropriate prompts to use to do that. So that is a uh, yeah that is a Maybe just a lightning round to close here, some mid to, to, to long range hopes for, for AI. For AI? Yeah. Mm -hmm. From, you know, maybe like exciting use cases, mid to, to, to longer term. Right. Luke, can we start with you? Uh, uh, okay, so, uh, so for, for me, uh, uh, also, I have. Uh, <laughs> so I don't, I don't worry about our generation. So our generation, for, for us, we have already done the training. Um, we already completed the training, and uh, the uh, the chat activities, those AI tools can be utilized to uh, simplify our work, to 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 do those tedious ones, and so that we can be uh, uh, safe. That is a hopefully good for us. But for the uh, next generation for our children, I don't know. Um, I think there there are there must be some efforts there um, to prevent that uh, to prevent our children from relying on this AI tools. Education and also everything. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so talk about hopes. <laughs> uh, I don't know how to put it in words exactly, but when I was thinking about the the image models, it kind of like feel that it gives us an unprecedented access to some sort of like collective memory or collective images of the civilization. So if we could like a little bit more controlled data input, it could be like very interesting for like comparative studies or even for designers, like they want to design a logo and they check the app weighted average representation of an apple based on some models or something like that. So that that's my hope that it would it would like be used for, for something similar like that. Great. I think I've shared plenty of concerns, so um, I guess I'm cautiously optimistic that AI is one of the best tools we have to solve large problems that we are facing that I don't see us solving any other way. So I don't have a whole lot of hope that it's going to do this, but when I think about like long-term hopes, maybe it'll solve climate change. Maybe it'll cure cancer. Maybe it'll do things that we just have other methods that we've tried haven't worked or we've been unwilling to try. So, um, you know, some people think that climate change will be solved by some new technology and maybe AI will be the one to do it for us. Nice. Well, let's uh, end on that note. First, let's thank our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please enjoy, hang out, uh, keep the conversation going. Thank you. Yeah,
Yeah. 